Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Natalia Kapitnik, Director of Communications at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Thank you for joining us for the second installment of our new special series, The Continent, where we explore how the war in Ukraine is changing Europe's politics and security. Just a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and will be available along with our previous episodes on our website, www.fpri.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and also here on Twitter. So with that, um, I think we'll get started, and I'll turn it over to Aaron. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Welcome to The Continent. I'm your host, Aaron. Uh, As was just mentioned on this podcast, uh, brought to you by the Foreign Policy Research Institute, or FPRI for short, I'm exploring how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is impacting politics, security, and society across Europe. Uh, If you're joining us for the first time, uh, last episode, this episode, and the rest of them will be hosted under FPRI's Chain Reaction Podcast, which you can access uh, most places you listen to podcasts. Our inaugural episode about two weeks ago was about Germany, and I encourage you to take a listen. Today, however, we're listening to Poland, which I might argue has faced the biggest direct impact among the countries this project will cover. We'll discuss that, though. What I'm curious about is the following. There's been a lot of talk about a new Europe emerging as a result of the war, a changed political situation, a new consensus in the EU or otherwise, uh, maybe a new threat emerging in countries uh, trying to balance and mitigate that threat. But a major lands war, refugee flows, states responding to a new threat, that new Europe sounds a lot to me like the old Europe. So what I'm curious about is for Poland, what has changed and what hasn't? Uh, This is now the part of the intro where I explain uh, the bad wordplay in the title. So I'm asking the same difference. Uh, Is it the same or different, but the same in Polish is Poland's parliament. Uh, Very funny, I know. Anyway, at this point, I would like to welcome our guests with a hearty Dzień Dobry. Joining us are Wojciech Przybylski and Anna Wojciech. I'll have them introduce ourselves, sorry, I'll have them introduce themselves and then we'll dive in. Wojciech, over to you. Can you tell us about your affiliation and research interests? Hi, hello, uh, Aaron. Very pleased to, to be uh, here on, on this Spaces um, live recording and on the, on the podcast later on. Um, my name is Wojciech Szybelski, which I understand is not the easiest to remember or even worse to pronounce again by any foreigner. I'm running um, a think tank and a media platform, um, Visegrad Insight. Um, probably you heard about the Visegrad Group, Central European Cooperation Platform. We are uh, not uh, in any way a governmental or government-funded uh, organization. We're a non-citizen uh, independent NGO uh, foundation, Respublica Foundation, that operates a program to connect and establish Central European um, analysis uh, on democratic security and advocate for, uh, with, with a lot of foresight um, in the back, uh, advocate for the best solutions uh, for improving democratic uh, security and centralism in Europe. Um, also, I'm a fellow at the Europe's Future Fellow, fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna for, for the current year, non-resident fellowship, to, to connect with other European uh, policy leaders or influencers um, across, across Europe. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to, 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 to join today. We're happy to have you too. Um, Anna, over to you if you'd be so kind. I'm working on rule of law issues in Poland uh, as a list and also as a researcher at the Polish Academy of Sciences. So I'm very happy to be able to discuss here the impact uh, of the current crisis on the democracy in Poland and humans. And uh, great to be here. Thanks. All right. Now that we have both of our guests, let's uh, take another rack at this. So I wanted to jump into our um, into our first kind of topic for discussion here that I alluded to in the intro um, and in the title of today's episode. Um, so in the German episode um, la- about two weeks ago, one of the points that stuck out to me was uh, a comment that what's changed for German politics was that the average German now feels threatened. Uh, that's a big change. So to start, and as we talk about how Polish society has been impacted by this war, um, has there been that, that change for Poland? Um, did the threat, was the threat perceived before? Um, how much of how much of a shift for for the average uh, poll ha- has occurred here? Um, we'll start. Uh, we'll go back to you, Anna, to start. I would say that that was a momentous shift for Polish society in a good way. Uh, so uh, actually, I would start with saying that the the response to the uh, Ukraine's crisis and to the wave of Ukrainian guests coming to Poland was very positive, and that was also um, an impactful on uh, self perception of Poles as though can actually provide assistance and help to those who are in need. The attitudes uh, towards Ukraine were positive before, but this has um, improved um, 
even more uh, during the current crisis. And of course, Poles has been historically wary of Russia, uh, Russia as a state. Uh, mainly, this sentiment has has also increased uh, during the uh, the last couple of uh, months. So uh, I think that there was a, rather um, maybe not a, a turn or a shift in the Polish society, but rather a, a feeling that some of the fears that we had towards Russia were warranted. Intuition, over to you. Absolutely agree with uh, Anna. I think two two slogans that I hear often in in describing what Poland has become, perhaps has, has always had inclination to become, as uh, Mark Brzezinski, ambassador, U.S. ambassador of Poland, says it's the biggest, uh, it's a humanitarian superpower. So, of course, I mean, that's a diplomatic also uh, way of flattering the nation, and he does that very well. Uh, but the other phrase I heard, uh, that we are the biggest NGO uh, in the world. Uh, and in that, uh, there there is the sense encapsulated of, of, of what's the situation. And on one hand, this is exactly as Anna described, the biggest in the modern history of the country sense of response, a collective response. Um, but it also is a, a lack of lack of coordination or lack of the, the absence of, of the central government in the picture, which uh, actually used a lot of time to decouple the civil society response, the humanitarian response, from its own actions and policy planning in the, in the previous months pre- preceding the, the war in, in Ukraine. And now, in effect, we have this amazing response, oftentimes not well coordinated, not well planned, and definitely under with, with, without all of the resources, which is disconnected from state activities. So to, to paint this picture, I, I, would, I would just say that, that the government is uh, subsequently you know, not organizing any sort of coalition between the civil, civil society actors we, as we see it today, but is oftentimes uh, communicating to the, to the world uh, that it represents uh, Poland. Uh, Kind of a paradox uh, of its own. So they are taking, they're cutting off, uh, you know, credit from from what the what the Poland and the civil society overall, and I mean entrepreneurs also and uh, local governments do. There's a couple of facets about kind of the current situation I wanted to ask about. I mean, one of the the things that's important to me in covering this podcast is not just making this a conversation about how think tanks and academia are talking about the crisis, but really how it's um, impacting regular average people. Um, and I think. Poland is particularly unique in the, the absolute you know, volume of refugees that have come over. The number I saw, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is about 3.5 million Ukrainians as of, I think, last week or so, uh, which for perspective is about two Warsaw's worth of people. That is, that is an absolutely huge, maybe unparalleled since you know, World War II flow of European refugees. So I wanted to ask about these uh, guests, Goszczy, as uh, Anna was uh, provided, the kind of word of the day in Polish. Uh, these Ukrainian guests, I want to ask about their their impact day to day on on Poland. Is this something that's seen all over the country? He is what kind of mobilization are you seeing day to day? Is this something people are talking about? Or are they being hosted everywhere? Tell me about uh, your experience, be that you know, personally or, or more broadly uh, through the news. We'll go back to Wojciech here. I might start with a personal story. So my parents are still hosting mother and teenage boy, some disability, uh, actually. And they're, they're doing that in the south of Poland. Away. They, they just went to a reception center and asked who can they help because they have room to host. And they've been for the last two months. Uh, but now they're starting to face some big questions, you know, because essentially they took the responsibility and they don't know for how long. They helped uh, the lady to get uh, to, to find a job in, in services related to, you know, a pharmacy uh, distribution, whatever center where she had some actually proper uh, professional experience. Uh, they managed to, to call uh, a Swiss company. I mean, reach out to a Swiss company that provided two sets of hearing devices for the, for the boy. For free. I mean, Swiss company simply, you know, and each piece costs like 2,000 euro. So that was quite, quite a thing because in Poland, you simply, you, you would not have it available or at least the discount would be uh, substantially lower. It wouldn't be. And these are personal experiences. I mean, we went with my daughter to, to a train station in Warsaw and we also asked because we have a spare room, uh, who could we host? We describe that we have one bed, you know, and, and someone to host. And we said, perhaps that would be uh, a woman and a child. At, the, at that point, and it was two months ago, a volunteer uh, who was there turned to us and said, well, uh, women and child, oh boy, they are sold out. I mean, they, they, she literally used that language, but not in a, in a, in a bad way, but just to, to say what was the, to give you the feeling of, of how much people wanted to help uh, those kind of people. And instead, she offered to take care of, of an elderly lady, uh, there are many also, who you would 
from really say are a little bit more lost in the whole situation. Because currently, as we speak, and I'll start, stop at this point, women with children who are really dominating the picture of, of all the cities in Poland, each city grew from 15% of population Warsaw, in the case of Warsaw, to some 30% of population in case of Katowice South, or, or many other bigger cities around Poland. Many of these cities uh, experience an influx of, uh, of children now attending classes, you know, schools together with Polish children, fast tracking some sort of, you know, like languages out here, Ukrainian and Polish, but they're not the same. So they need to learn quickly how to learn, uh, how to read and, and, and speak and write and to plug in into the system. But still, this is happening. So don't, you don't see tens of refugees around Poland. You see, uh, however, lots of, a lot more people in the streets in the public services like schooling, but also healthcare. And there is a positive response that has been there in the first, but also what we're getting into this dynamic of the last uh, of the last three months, people are starting to worry about sustainability and the future because my parents and myself, uh, we haven't seen the promised money from, from, from the state government, you know, 10 euro to support the costs for anyone who hosts the, the, the refugees. This money is simply not being distributed by the government, being promised. And again, I'm very, very so skeptical about how much there is uh, talk and how much is delivered uh, from, from the level of the central government in Poland. Anna, tell us about your experience with uh, the guests. Well, so definitely um, it's important to note that the war came to Poland to Warsaw actually on the first day um, when Russia invaded Ukraine. So actually a couple of hours later, first train started arriving at Warsaw East Station or actually close to the place where, where I live. And, um, and this impact has been huge, uh, especially in the first uh, month. It was, it was very visible. Um, but what the Polish state has done, and it's uh, at least on paper uh, quite remarkable, uh, is that it granted um, the identification number named PESEL to more than one million Ukrainians, uh, half of them children, and that it uh, provided Ukrainians with access to healthcare, to uh, social benefits, including a benefit for children. And um, also that it uh, it basically treats uh, Ukrainian guests as if they were Polish citizens, or almost like that. Uh, so this is this is really a huge a huge element of this response that allows Ukrainians to integrate better, uh, and also to keep track to monitor um, the flow of people who came to Poland because because initially that was also a very problematic aspect that we didn't really know who was coming, how many people, and what happened to them. And uh, during such a big uh, wave of people uh, coming to Poland, uh, obviously there were also some instances of human trafficking, of uh, migrants who disappeared or or were disappeared. And this is uh, where the work of NGOs and um, uh, Polish human um, rights organizations in, and the state um, office of the Commissioner for Human Rights uh, was crucial. Uh, so this first phase w- was quite chaotic. And right now, um, Poland tries to, to manage to better integrate um, this huge number of people in Polish society, economy. Uh, according to official statistics, more than 100,000 Ukrainian refugees already found registered employment in Poland. And um, I assume that many more are in informal economy. But also, uh, many had or still have caring responsibilities for children, for, for the elderly, for the disabled, people with disabilities. And um, so I think that the Polish state right now needs to rethink a little bit um, also the options that were not that much available to Poles either, uh, such as uh, availability of daycare, especially in bigger cities, and um, whether the schools have sufficient number of teachers and how the programs are constructed in the Polish schools to allow Ukrainian children not only to learn the Polish language, but also perhaps to follow the Ukrainian curriculum and still speak their own language. And uh, right now we are at the moment when the pupils in Polish schools are passing exams at the end of primary schools and at the end of high school A-levels. And uh, 47% of Ukrainian students uh, who are Uh, eligible to pass A-levels, declared that they would like to do it in the Polish language, but this is, of course, a big challenge to them because, well, we the languages are, as Wojciech rightly mentioned, are similar or from the similar 
a family of languages, but still it is it is a, a really big uh, a drastic change for them. And also it is important to note that in addition to the current wave of Ukrainian refugees, we also have had um, a big wave of uh, political refugees from uh, neighboring Belarus. And many of them are living in Warsaw. There are many students at the universities um, in Warsaw and other cities in Poland uh, coming from Ukraine, coming from Belarus. So this is really a development that is um, impacting Polish society in an unprecedented way. And until five years ago, it was a really, really homogeneous, closed society in this respect. So um, optimistic. Um, but still, I think that um, the state needs to learn how to even manage a little bit of diversity has increased that that was welcomed into Poland. So I think that, as Wojciech well mentioned, we also uh, are at this moment where uh, the Polish hosts, Polish families, individuals are also feeling that they cannot host um, people in their houses for much longer. And this creates big demand at the housing market, at the rental market. And this created in some cities um, a sort of like a housing crisis. Uh, so prices of rent increased drastically. And this, this contributes uh, to feeling of unrest, especially that the theme of the cost of living crisis is dominating right now the headlines of, of Polish press. Understood. Um, and that's really, really fascinating color from both of you. I wanted to drill down on that. So Anna, if I have a follow-up question, then we'll turn it back to check. But one of the things you mentioned as we were planning for this episode is this theme of Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about that. And if I might share a personal anecdote of my own, my uh, grandparents were initially, or my grandmother was initially from Poland. Um, and she, uh, growing up, had some, how do I say this delicately, not very nice things to say about Ukraine. It's a long World War II story that we're not going to get into on, uh, on this podcast. Uh, but I've seen personally her view towards Ukraine and Ukrainians turn around. Her tell me, how could you possibly not sympathize um, with, with Ukrainians at a time like this and what they're going through? So I wanted to ask about reconciliation. Um, we'll start with you, Anna. Reconciliation from what? How do you see that reconciliation kind of playing out day to day? So uh, Poles, Ukrainians and other minorities, um, including a Jewish minority, had centuries of shared coexistence um, in, in the same part of Europe. And unfortunately, there were many tensions, ethnic tensions, religious tensions throughout centuries. So um, in, with regard to the Ukrainian-Polish uh, reconciliation, uh, it is important to note that the Polish landowners had uh, big properties in what is today Ukraine and also Belarus. And, um, and there was usually this ethnic, religious, and also later um, nationalistic conflict uh, between the landowners and those who worked for them, uh, those who had or later developed Polish, Belarusian, Ukrainian, Jewish identity. So this, this conflict uh, culminated during the Second World War in the so-called Volynia massacres, where there was um, a very brutal ethnic cleansing uh, committed uh, by the Ukrainian nationalists. And there was also retaliation by, by Poles. And these memories are um, really present in many families, including in my family. I was born in Western Poland, but uh, my family was uh, displaced after the Second World War. And uh, I think that this conflict today proves that we are able to go past grievances and that we are able to look into the future, into the common future together. And in this respect, it is uh, really important to see political efforts um, by President uh, Duda and President Zelensky, who are speaking of establishing a sort of a new a treaty between Poland and Ukraine, modeled perhaps a treaty that was established between France and Germany, um, the Elysee Treaty. And this would um, provide more sustained uh, cooperation to coordinate policy priorities between the two countries, and that would increase even more our shared sense uh, of common future. So this, of course, happens, this reconciliation happens on uh, this political level, the highest level, uh, but it also happens in daily life. As you mentioned, the, the generation of our grandparents who, uh, and great-grandparents who were uh, children um, during the Second World War today, if they are still with us, they maybe even can see themselves in those children who are fleeing uh, Ukraine with their mothers. So I think uh, the empathy trumps really um, nationalistic consideration in this respect, and that's a great source of hope to me. That is uh, word for word what my grandmother said about uh, seeing herself, her own experience in the World War II and the uh, experience of children today. Wojciech, anything to add on that topic? 
yes, I I think I would not focus so much on the reconciliation because that it's it's not the, the thing that is happening is not really about you know fighting off or living through the memory. It's setting foundations for something new, and it's setting foundations on um, on this that on the lines that Anna also explains in not so new in the European context because there are some nation states that have tried that, um, and we were never in such a conflict as Germany and France. So there's, there's a bit, be, be wary of the boundaries of those parallels. However, what is what is completely new uh, and what is also unique in the Polish perspective vis-à-vis -vis Central European neighbors that is, for, for instance, absent in the context of, of Hungary um, and, and Hungarian neighborhood, same neighborhood, really, is strategic culture in Poland that has been developed mid-20th century around Paris-based uh, intellectual milieu, a journal, uh, Kultura, culture, a magazine, with uh, some heavyweights on board writing there um, and, and also lots of literary writing around that, developing a common common uh, bipartisan perspective of, of how to look at the future of Poland's, Poland's security. And Ukraine is in the center of Polish thinking about its own security in Europe. This thinking assumes that in order for Poland, and by the way, also for Czechoslovakia and Hungary, for all the nation states of Central Eastern Europe to be, to be free, you need to have countries like Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine in the times of Soviet Union, part of the you know part, part of the bloc, also independent of Russian imperialism, with a hypothesis for the future that in order to really secure the future well-being, you need to establish also Russia as a nation state free of its imperial legacy and tendency. So in a in a big picture, this is something that we have not only written about journals, these were the foundations of Polish political uh, thinking and uh, foreign policy thinking throughout what is now, you would say, 70 or so uh, years. And that is the foundations also of a bipartisan consensus on foreign policy and the response to Ukraine, it, which is nearly automatic in our thinking, but then deserves um, an explanation why, that it, why, why it is happening here. See an opportunity as Poland in developing uh, independent Ukraine uh, to secure ourselves, to be safer as a, you know, to have to make Europe overall a safer place, and in particular our country in the system of, of European security much safer, safer from aggressive uh, imperialism that is manifested today by Russia. So as much as there is there are elements of reconciliation, memory, I wouldn't even emphasize that so much. It reflects, of course, some worries in particular segments of the society. It is much more um, a fundamentally uh, present in, in and embodied by the president of Poland, uh, who, whose competences are also uh, security and, and defense uh, policy, where, where he immediately embraces. And he's got a popular mandate to do that. He embraces an opportunity to, to everything's possible, everything that is possible to uphold nation building in a way, but also independence of, of, of Ukraine. And if, if Poland is here an indispensable element, because simply geographically, this is the border through which you can do so much, um, then, then, then it's uh, only great. And it's being, it's using, it's, uh, it's using the opportunity uh, that arises and it's the terrible crisis, uh, humanitarian crisis and the terrible war uh, that, that Russia wages on, on, on the neighboring country. So wanted to uh, follow up with you about the politics. You mentioned uh, President Duda, but one of the things I wanted to ask about maybe in contrast to Germany, and this may be a sweeping generalization on my part, which is why I want to ask. One of the things we talked about on our Germany episode was the, the daylight between parties historically and currently about how to respond to this crisis. Um, how tough a line should be drawn against Russia. Now, it strikes me traditionally that in the Polish political system and between the current government and opposition, there's a lot less daylight, um, that there's more uniform, I don't want to say anti-Russia, but more of uniform support for a tougher line. Is that assessment correct? Uh, do you see any differences between the ways various parties are messaging around the crisis? Uh, back to you, Wojciech, on that. Yes, there is a there is a valid point of, of difference, but uh, let me underline again the commonality. There is, again, there is a strong foundation that hasn't been broken, hasn't been shaken, has been reinforced in the past months. That That is the foundation uh, of, of cooperation on foreign policy between the major parties uh, across, the, across the aisle. So despite their, Poland is heavily polarized and it's, it's polarizing even on the refugee response and the policies on refugee response. It is still on foreign policy, on the response to Ukraine, but also previously, very notably, uh, response 
to, uh, to what was going on for the past years in Belarus, united. And it is able to communicate um, together in, in upholding uh, the effort to build these countries as democracies, as, as uh, you know, established for the people, by the people. The difference is in approach when it comes to the Polish government and Polish opposition. So we have a semi-presidential system. It's, uh, it's important perhaps to uh, underline here with a strong role of the president of Poland, but, uh, elected in the popular vote with uh, foreign policy and uh, defense uh, policy competen competences and some important role in the legislatures and the uh, uh, cabinet governments uh, from elected from the parliament. Uh, these two are not often, uh, they're not always hand in hand, but in our, in our current se setting, both the president and the government come from the same camp. And yet they, they are not always doing the same things or they're not, sometimes they are contradicting each other. And I think the best example uh, is where President Duda s is seen and today performs as a transatlantic link uh, of the Polish government and Poland uh, in the response of building connectivity bridges, but also keeping an eye on Poland's uh, uh, role in Europe, uh, trying to reverse some of the, of the legislation that has been hampering the relationship with the European Union institutions and other neighbors in Europe. And the government um, is pursuing very, you know, as if we were in the, for the, uh, all the years of, of the term in an electoral campaign, is pursuing a very polarized message and in fact, the government, the national government from elected from the parliament, uh, the cabinet government is um, very vocal on attacking and accusing verbally partners across Europe uh, from Norway, Germany, France and, and other uh, member states of the EU of inactivity, of not delivering, of living off from this crisis instead of helping. So there, there are those lines in that are have been have been uh, recurring lines of this particular right wing government throughout the past seven years uh, in, in power that are only now amplified and that undermine, ultimately, they undermine the ambitions set forth uh, by President Duda, who in a historic speech in the Ukrainian parliament this Sunday promised to make everything possible in his powers, but all that he spoke for the whole of Poland, to get Ukraine uh, membership secured. There is also a new initiative by the Slovak president and Polish president to do a tour um, in, in Europe to convince uh, member states and governments to, to actually accept Ukraine as a candidate for the European Union membership in, you know, in, the, in the future. Um, there is a council decision coming up at the end of June about that. Uh, and the actions of Polish government that you know, that distance Poland and undermine the uh, credibility of such efforts with Polish uh, problems with the rule of law, with Polish uh, conflict, uh, or with the European institutions or partners. And the opposition is saying exactly that. To, in order to fulfill the general grant objective, which is upkeeping the, the Ukraine's move towards the European Union and their ref democratic reforms, and to embed and, and, and to be the real good advocate of Ukraine in Europe, we ourselves, Poland, need to demonstrate to all of our European partners that we can also perform so they do not have second thoughts, you know, of admitting a country or allowing a country on the way to the European Union, which uh, by comparison with Poland might seem like uh, yet another troublemaker in the long run. So that would put some of our partners on hold. And I think there is a window of opportunity for Poland to, to change that amidst this current crisis. But uh, um, so far, we don't see uh, a clear sign that the government would embrace this moment. And I want to ask you about some of these underlying uh, rule of law problems, liberalism. If you could first, just for the uh, listener who may not be you know, following the, the details of this, could you talk through some of the current conflict, some of the kind of policy disagreements, uh, kind of the, the, the contours of the problem in Poland first, then we can delve in from there? Absolutely. So after uh, the United Rights government started governing in 2015, it has immediately started uh, curbing judicial independence, appointing loyalists to key institutions of the justice system, and also later abusing the disciplinary system for judges to silence uh, its policy critics. And this created a major political and legal conflict with the EU institutions. Um, the political conflict started uh, in late 2017 when the European Commission, the EU executive branch, uh, for the first time in the Union's history, launched the so-called Article 7 procedure of political dialogue. Fortunately, the, this whole dialogue uh, was not very successful. And since uh, 
2018, we have seen cases and judgments of the top court of the European Union. And this court found that many of the changes introduced in Poland are in violation of EU law standards. And in 2021, um, the Polish authorities stopped implementing those judgments and started even challenging them using a captured institution, the Constitutional Tribunal. And this uh, demonstrated the European Union institutions that the political dialogue and also the legal dialogue is going nowhere. And the Commission started using financial pressure on a big scale. And an opportunity for that was um, a new financial instrument, um, the so-called post-pandemic recovery package um, that the member states agreed to um, introduce to finance um, and to spur growth and innovation after the pandemic. And this is a huge amount of money. We are speaking about 36 billion euros. And um, the European Commission needs to approve, to greenlight uh, the recovery plan presented by uh, the governments of the member states. And um, actually, uh, most EU uh, governments have been already spending this money. And Brussels has been withholding approval of of the plan presented by Morawiecki's government. Um, so this became um, the moment the main point of discussions. And the European Commission said that it requires Poland to reinstate judges that were illegally suspended for criticizing changes into the justice system, that the structural guarantees to judicial independence needs to be put in place, and that a so-called disciplinary chamber in the Supreme Court, which was key in, in the system of disciplining judges, uh, shall be abolished. And um, these were uh, the basic conditions um, laid out uh, by uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission's president. And um, President Duda, in February, so almost uh, half a year after um, after the judgments, those, th- those important judgments of the European Court were presented, uh, President Duda presented his bill that um, aims at uh, implementing um, some of these judgments. Um, unfortunately, this is more of a smokescreen than a real change, and it does not touch upon the key issues uh, that are key in this conflict. Uh, however, uh, the European Commission, um, in the current uh, the geopolitical context, is really willing to to make a deal with Poland, with, with the Polish government. And um, according to current rumors, uh, the recovery plan will be accepted in a week. So uh, this is really how the, 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 the geopolitical situation changed the domestic rule of law struggle. Uh, but I think in this context, it is even more important for other partners, such as the U.S., to monitor the rule of law and also media freedom in Poland. And the U.S. has been a very important fa- uh, ally in this respect. So, yeah, follow up question there. I um, wanted to ask both of you uh, about two two pronged kind of tendency trends uh, happening here. Um, where you see um, Poland's, by virtue of the fact it's you know, a larger state in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, fairly militarily strong comparatively, um, kind of occupying a important place where it can you know, certainly provide weapons to Ukraine and has a willingness to do. But you also see um, a greater maybe political will among EU states, France, Germany, to reform the institution or make it stronger to take a tougher line. So I'm I'm wondering whether whether that this, this, this war kind of changes the, the balance uh, of you know, power between Poland and the EU, um, changes the balance of power with these, these rule of law issues. Does it uh, give Poland more leverage? Does it give the EU more leverage? How do you see that uh, shaking out? And I'll, I'll turn this to, to Wojciech. So that's a, that's a really good question. I think it's a central question. Part, part of the conversation that uh, actually me and Anna was also uh, involved in, in with the members of the European Parliament in the, in the first month of the, of the war and the refugee crisis um, was about whether this is actually a right moment to pursue the rule of law between Europe and Poland, as clearly there is a, there is a demand for solidarity standing together in, in, you know, as, as Europe all together and member states. Um, in the response to something that is that is not clearly, um, you know, the, the, from the same rank of order, and what what we often said, I, I, the media Anna has a bit different approach or how she would say, it, but I think I, I can fairly say that that is a, a general approach, is that first of all these are not two distinct issues. If Ukraine is fighting Russia, or rather Russia is attacking Ukraine, it's because you has taken already the steps towards European integration before. The ongoing conflict since 2014 
has started, you know, occupation of Crimea, taking of the bus, all the casualties from Kiev, Maidan Square, Euromaidan protests uh, were shot uh, because they fought uh, for uh, European belonging and European standards. It was not about geopolitics so much. I mean, geopolitics to me is more, more of a Russian word, a uh, Russian expression of something that Ukraine wanted and still wants is to build democracy, build a fair system of uh, you know, rule-based, rules-based society and economy in which they can advance and they can uh, uh, make uh, a whole of, uh, including their own nation state, a better place. So there, there is a big choice in which they've been making and they're fighting for uh, where an indispensable element is, is the rule of law. So there is a, it's a central element that we treat rule of law as, as an element of this big struggle that is taking place and the, all the refugees and relief and, you know, and war effort is, is, is kind of put in the, in the first stage. And then there is another element that we also um, discussed that, uh, you know, rule of law, I would, I would say it like that, the response to the question of rule of law should be as if there was no war effort. And the response to the war effort and standing in solidarity with Poland and with Ukraine should be as if there were no you know, issues and polarization and fight on the question of rule of law. And that's in a way coupled approach in, in practical terms, not on the philosophical terms that I explained earlier, uh, is, is uh, seeming, seemingly to me prevailing uh, from, from the European institutions, from a number of states which seem to be realizing but at the end of the day, this is about winning peace. And once you have peace, you need a peace on, on, on good terms. And part of these terms is that you have a secure environment with, with not, uh, not worsened uh, rule of law situation, but actually consolidated reform towards better rule of law uh, situation. And that's, that's the, 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 main, uh, the, the main battlefield as well. Um, you, can't, you can't really decouple also people who, who became you know, first responders in this crisis, activists, uh, civil society uh, organizations, who oftentimes they simply change their hats to become refugee, uh, re refugee respondents and, and hosts and, and you know, people coming to the border to help. Uh, but otherwise, uh, they have another hat and they're oftentimes they are actually standing up for the rule of law, the, the, the independence of the judicial system. And, and a rule-based uh, society in Poland. So this is also an element of, of, of who, you know, of agency here that, that belongs to the society overall to Poles, the biggest NGO in the, in the world, as I said, that needs to be respected in the context of, uh, of where Poland wants to go. Anna, your thoughts on the question? I would say that the impatience towards Poland and, Germ uh, and Hungarian governments in the European Union uh, is growing, especially in the member states that belong to the so-called rule of law friends group. And these include the Netherlands and also the northern member states of the EU. And um, I think that um, even though um, the European Union as a whole and also the member states are positively surprised with the Polish response um, to um, the migration crisis and um, to, to the war effort, uh, they will not uh, forget about the years of um, actually uh, attacking the principle of mutual trust between uh, EU member states. And also, um, unfortunately, the Polish government in the last year has increased tensions uh, regarding uh, the relations between the EU law and national law. And this is something that is very worrisome for um, many member states and their judiciaries. So um, in this regard, today we see that more attention is being paid to, to even more authoritarian turn of Viktor Orban's Hungary. Uh, but still, the political elites are uh, very much discussing the rule of law situation in Poland and, in, um, and even that the European Commission actually decides to greenlight the recovery plan and um, lessen the pressure on Poland, that would uh, tremendously lower the um, position um, and the trust towards the European Commission in the European Union. So uh, we also need to see this issue of the rule of law issue always as a multilateral topic uh, that has like several layers of impact, not only on uh, relations uh, between Brussels and, uh, and one member state, but also on, on the whole concept of the EU and European integration. Um, and um, this year we've seen that uh, the EU is more and more ready to um, employ, deploy or 
possible sanctioning mechanism, including financial sanctions against um, Viktor Orban's Hungary. So uh, in this context, uh, we will see, I think the Hungary will be um, the laboratory of uh, all those mechanisms being implemented. And later, in an event that Poland is still the rule of law troublemaker, then they will probably in next years be used also against Poland. So we'll see. But I don't think that there would be uh, like uh, that the, 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 the war in Ukraine fundamentally closed the whole rule of law crisis. Well, not to uh, give a spoiler for future podcast episodes here, but we will be talking at length about uh, Hungary in the future. So listeners, uh, stay tuned for that. We have about 10 minutes left, so I want to uh, turn to our final question here. And it's one that came to mind kind of political risk style based on some homework and reading that Wojciech gave me uh, from a project uh, from Visegrad Insight about the future of political scenarios in cent- uh, Central and Eastern Europe. It was called Central Europe 2025, uh, if I'm not mistaken, came out in 2018. And there's one scenario in particular, and the scenarios ranged from the triumphant march of the liberalism to kind of a Eastern European spring where the youth, you know, stood up for democracy. But one situation in a particular, um, or one scenario that was uh, titled shotgun wedding, where a, a security crisis brought on, you know, externally by Russia in this case, uh, credit to the authors for saying around 2020, you know, not, not too far off, um, a, a security crisis uh, forced cooperation on a number of issues and, uh, perhaps greater integration between uh, Eastern Europe, maybe grudgingly, um, and Western Europe. So I want to ask, and we'll go back to Wojciech here because this was your suggestion. I wanted to ask, to what extent do you see this scenario as realistic based on what's happened? And then for both of you, I wanted to ask you know, what key signposts are you for? What news are you on the hunt for? What news would you be looking for if you were you know, looking for signs that things were improving or maybe on, on the converse, things were worsening between the EU and Poland. So Wojciech, I'd, I'd ask you first, um, how realistic is this shotgun wedding scenario looking to you right now? That scenario is still plausible. And we have seen that Poland was on a much more of a collision course in the past, you know, past months, collision course with Europe uh, than in the very recent month. However, we do not see, we do not see exactly what we essentially wrote in this scenario: uh, a change of mind without changing your hearts. We see that negotiations over the rule of law, of withdrawal from the most controversial regulations on the rule of law, is progressing. Anna mentioned that we are probably close on signing an agreement, which is one step in the still forthcoming decisions about releasing the money in negotiations between Poland and the European Commission. But this um, this is still going slow. And then the window of opportunity for this scenario to play out fully would be within this term limit, because we'll see what the next elections bring. And there, there is some like, likelihood that the government would not prevail or we would not be able to construct a majority, a simple majority without a coalition partner that would just shift the whole political landscape. And But as the elections are coming in closer, which they, they're expected to take place in autumn 2023, we will see more and more elements of polarization. So actually with this government, quite likely elements in which the government will say, probably, uh, you know, that Europe has failed, we are all alone, <laughs> you know, may Polish nation states is all, all there is to um, to respond. And this, this mess of decoupling Poland from the greater European project might be, might be prevailing. I think the scenario is still plausible. You can still imagine that uh, because of the financial needs, for instance, the government has, it will give significant concessions uh, to simply follow the book um, of, of European uh, Union membership. But to, that, that doesn't seem uh, anymore as such a likely pivot uh, for the government, as it was, uh, it was seemingly in the in the first months of the response. Time flies. We will see um, as the crisis gets also uh, worse. Um, but definitely, um, the the I, I would still like to underline that what happened within the parameters of that scenario is that we didn't go as far away from the West as we could have been uh, going with, without uh, the. In, in the end of last year, coming war, and then when the war broke out. 
a clear example of that is, again, the transatlantic turn of the president, uh, Duda, who was perhaps one of, the, one of those politicians in Europe, in NATO, to, be, to, to congratulate Mr. Biden on his elect victory as, as the last in the row. Uh, in otherwise, probably the most uh, transatlantic and you know, US-friendly uh, society in Europe which is Poland. And then, uh, because he eventually knew of the upcoming crisis, he took the responsibility for, of leadership. And he turned uh, with a veto on the media law that the government sponsored and wanted to implement. He turned uh, his back on the national government to restore trust, transatlantic trust, and had some other initiatives that would put Poland in a much darker, much worse place if, if he hadn't taken that action. And he took that action Specifically, in expectation, uh, as we know from the briefs from, from late November, it was uh, very much probable and expected, and, and the West was unifying around the message also from the U.S. to, uh, to respond to the upcoming conflict. So he took the steps that, that uh, got Poland not in a worse position, perhaps a bit better position than, than we used to be uh, or could have been with, with a different course of action. So I still think we are in the, somewhere in the parameters of that scenario, but I wouldn't hope for every uh, little bit of that scenario to play out, including the question of, of Eurozone membership. Well, that's not on the table uh, for this country uh, with this government yet. But there are interesting voices from many skeptics about Poland's uh, membership in the Eurozone that have, because of the war, also changed. So uh, the, 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 the general direction is, is pretty well described, I believe. Anna, over to you for the last comments this episode. Uh, what news or potential developments are, are you trying to keep an eye on as you uh, observe how this scenario with uh, Europe, potentially with the U.S., evolves? Poland and Poles need to understand, and I think we have understood this quite acutely, that we are not looking for the help of the West, but we are the West. We are the part of a democratic free world, and we need to play according to the rules, the rules of international law, European law that are in place in order to be secure, because this current conflict demonstrated that there's really no way out for Poland. There is no turn eastwards. And this is reflected very much in the opinion polls that clearly demonstrate polls would not vote for any party that supports Russia for Russia's stance, and that the civilizational um, decision has been already very much made. But what is difficult is that Poland needs to accept to play by the rules and that we have percent, quite a big percentage of voters who are fine with breaking the rules or trying to circumvent them as long as the governing politicians are providing them with security, such as welfare security, and uh, maybe a sense of cultural belonging. Um, um, but I'm pretty sure that's will decide quite rationally that uh, they need to cultivate good relationships with the United States so that the transatlantic relationship is important, but also that they need to uh, improve relations with their closest neighbors, with the closest trading partners in Europe, and that Poland can profit and be safe only in, in this um, architecture that sees both NATO and the EU stronger together. I don't see any, luckily, any serious voices that would try to undermine these two alliances. And again, contrasting this with Hungary, in Hungary, there is a lot of interest in developing relationships with China uh, and also with Russia, which is surprising in the current context. But still, um, they seek other options outside of NATO, outside of the EU. And in Poland, luckily, we still have, have orientation towards developing these partnerships. So I think that uh, the Polish society will need to will need to learn also that, that it needs to, to prepare some guarantees, not only like constitutional guarantees, but also some economic welfare guarantees that would enable authoritarians to gain power in the future. And I think this is a big task for the current pro-democratic opposition in Poland. And in an event that they win elections next year, then it will be a great test uh, on democratic forces if they are democratic only on paper or if they have um, strength and the vision to actually improve the quality of Poland's democracy. So I really hope that, uh, that they will do this direction. All that said, I want to thank both of you, Alan Wojcik, and I want to thank the guests for joining today. Um, I certainly learned a lot over this conversation. It was very valuable and uh, hopefully contributes to the broader discourse. I'll turn this over back to FBRI, but again, thanks to both of you for joining. 
Thanks, Aaron. Um, and thanks again to our guests, Anna and Wojciech, for this thought-provoking conversation. And of course, to all of our listens- listeners for participating. Uh, as a reminder, if you missed any part of the discussion, the recording will be available shortly. To explore more from FPRI's research, podcasts, and upcoming events, be sure to visit us on www.fpri.org. Until next time.